Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to do something today that part of it will seem very trivial, like why are we going through all this? Because we're going to establish a new, new form of notation. Okay? So I'm going to start with a basis, and my general way of doing things, I always use capital D for basis, just to make it simple. A basis for R2, I'm going to write as 1, 0, and 0, 1. That's kind of, yeah, oh, duh. Well, this is called the standard basis of R2. Now, what I want to do is write a vector in terms of this basis, because I also want to do a non-standard basis, which I'll call B prime. Again, this is kind of universal notation. Um, it is more common that people will use capital B for their standard basis and then B prime for some non-standard basis. So let me give you a non-standard basis. Both of these will serve as a basis for R2. The first one's obviously easier to work with than the second one. So let's take just a random vector. Consider vector, let's call it vector, uh, vector w. Consider vector w, let's say it's 4, negative 6. What I would like to do is write vector w as a linear combination of the vectors in v, and separately as a linear combination of the vectors in v prime. So we can get used to how to write things in general. Well, so this clearly is 4 times 1, 0, plus negative 6 times 0, 1. Do you all agree with that? That's kind of a no-brainer. Now, the second one, it's something times 1, 1, plus something times 1, negative 1. Eh, that's not quite as obvious and as easy for me. Hmm. If you can do this in your head, more power to you, but you don't need to do this in your head. So let me do this. C1, C2, and let's figure out what C1 and C2 are. So that's going to require a matrix 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 4, negative 6. Why? Because that's a column for the first vector, the column for the second vector, and the column for the solution. So if I do negative row 1 plus row 2, 0, negative 2, negative 10. Good. C2 is going to be 5, and C1 is going to be, looks like, negative 1. Does that look correct to you? I'm sure you all could have trial and errored it eventually, but that's really not a method. Besides, what if I had given you vectors in R3? I mean, there's no way we would want to try to guess coefficients. That would be just, well, that would be silly. So how about what I say, negative one of these plus five of these. All right, everybody good with that? So now, what we're gonna do, again, I have to do this off to the side. This is usually what you're going to do. I didn't have to do it on the first one because of the choice of, of basis. So now what I wanna do is write W in terms of this basis and W in terms of this basis. So in the first case, we write it like this. W relative to basis B. I put W in a bracket, and I put B as a subscript. And what I do is I put the coefficients in vector form. So either as a column matrix or as a vector. For what we're doing now, a column matrix will be more useful. So what we're saying is the coefficients that are applied to the basis and that will give me back w are 4 and negative 6. Now, for the second problem, I want to write w in terms of b prime. So now I will use negative 1 and 5. There are an infinite number of bases I could use for R2. And every one of them would give me a different representation of the W. There's no way I'd, I'd ever get the same one twice. Are you with me on that one? So what we're doing is we're writing a vector relative to a basis. Now, you could, by the way, if you want to write it in vector form, that's fine too. We're going to be performing some matrix multiplications along the way here. So that's why writing it as a column matrix is more useful because it makes it easier to do the, the next thing. Hmm. 
So is there a matrix I could have multiplied that would have given me that? Now think about that for a moment. Is there a matrix I could have multiplied that would have given me this? Yeah, when I set up my system of equations, we have the coefficient matrix. If I multiplied by an inverse, I would have got this. So now I'm going to define something about the matrices themselves. So we're going to define something called a transition matrix. From B to B prime. Now, there's two possibilities for this. The most common and the most generic is I start with the standard basis and I move to a non-standard basis. The only other one would be to start with a non-standard basis and move to a different non-standard basis. We're going to do that one also. That's less common, but that one, it, sometimes it's easier to see what the big picture is. Again, the most common problem you're going to do is from a standard basis to a non-standard basis, which is also less intense algebraically. Okay? And I, I mentioned last day, non-standard bases are actually far more important if you have the right one. So you never go from a non-standard to a standard? No, you're never going to go in that direction. Because the standard basis you already know, it's really easy to do all of this, but I need to move to make it something a little more complicated. You wouldn't start with a non-standard and go the other way, just because the situation would never dictate. There is a non-standard basis out there. Like I call it the magic basis. Every problem that exists has a non-standard basis out there somewhere. It's the one we're trying to find, and we'll always start with a standard and try to get there. But there are also situations where you're going to go from non one non-standard to a different non-standard. And this is an, uh, a matrix multiplication is usually how we do this. So I'm going to start with this problem because it's much easier. We're going to do a transition matrix from B to B prime. So what you're going to do is you're going to start by putting the vectors of B prime as columns. Put the vectors as columns, not as rows in this case. On the other side, you're going to put the vectors of B. Okay? You're going to do row operations on this until the left side looks like the identity. Hmm. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? And the right side will be a matrix we call P inverse. P inverse is the transition matrix. Now, right off the bat, you'd say, wait, why not we just call it P? It's P inverse because of how it's going to work. There is a matrix P out there somewhere, too. P and P inverse will work hand in hand much later on. <laughs> At the end of chapter 6, we do them both. But for now, this matrix is called P inverse. And it's called the transition matrix from B to B prime. Now, because one of my bases was the standard basis, then the matrix relative to basis B will look like what? The matrix relative to this basis, if these guys are going down as columns, will look like what? The identity, the identity matrix. Yeah. Well, that makes my life a little easier, doesn't it? Yeah. So if one of my bases is the standard basis, then this is going to look like the identity because I'm putting them as columns. If they were both non-standard, then neither one of these looks like the identity. But like the question you asked earlier, I'm never going to go from non-standard to standard. So this is never going to be the identity here. But often this will be the identity here, which means that the feel of this problem will be the same feel as if you were just finding the inverse of a matrix. Because isn't that how you do it? So for this problem here, what would the problem look like? It would look like 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. Now, I know you know how to find an inverse of a 2 by 2, but this is the general process because, again, I, I might not have a standard basis, in which case this would be, still be the only way to find it. So let's do negative row 1 plus row 2. And then let's take negative a half of row two. And then finally, negative row two plus row one. So the negative of this plus this, 
think that's what we're going to get here. Okay, so based on what I have here, a half, a half, negative a half. Okay. Now, B and B prime are not matrices. They are sets of vectors. I create a matrix by putting those vectors as columns. Can everybody understand that? B is not a matrix. Okay. So when I'm setting this up, it's very important. Again, we realize these are the columns of B prime to create the matrix. If I use rows, I will get a different answer. Okay. So in this context, it's got to be columns. When a matrix multiplication is involved in general, it's got to be columns. Okay. So how can I use this to get from one place to another? Hmm. Well, the way this is going to work, let's see. I can erase. I'm going to erase this. So the idea is I have a vector relative to a basis. I want to convert it to a vector relative to a different basis. So I'm going to give you the most general. I have vector v in general relative to basis b. I want to convert it to vector v relative to basis b prime. The way I do this is by using the transition matrix very specifically from b to b prime. In this case, that's p inverse. Well, I am changing this into this, so this is the one I need to multiply. Now, where does p inverse go? On the left or on the right? How come? Dimension. Two by two, this is two by one. So it's got to go on the left. So I want to put an equal sign here. The definition of P inverse, in words, it's the transition matrix very specifically from B to B prime. Now, going back to Zachary's question, what if I want to go from B prime to B? Well, that's where matrix P would come in. If P inverse exists, then obviously P exists, and I would do something different. That's usually not the route we're interested in. We're interested in a one-way route here. So let's see if this actually works for this problem. Okay. Let's see, did I do the right one? Okay. So if I do this, four halves minus six halves is negative two halves or negative one. Four halves plus six halves is ten halves or five. Gee, what a shock. This is, well, that's what it was supposed to be. You guys could have figured this out without doing a matrix multiplication, obviously, but that's, that's really not the point. Okay, everybody with me so far? Now I want to do a non-standard to a non-standard so you can see why the process is necessary. Let's come up with one more basis. Um, let's call it B, B double prime, how about it? B double prime, let's call, how about um, two, negative one, one, two. I'm keeping the number small on purpose. Now let's find the transition matrix from B prime to B double prime. Okay? Well, <laughs> look on your face. You usually you start with one and you end up with something else. I'm going from non-standard to non-standard now. So now I'm gonna go from here to here. Nothing's different in the process. So the first part of the problem is now it's done. It's gone. It's finito. So let's, I don't need this anymore. I do need this, so I'm going to put this up here. Oops, uh, that's one, 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 negative one. So W relative to B prime, we know is this. There we go. All right. So brand new problem. That B is not even part of, the, part of the question anymore. I now want to find a new transition matrix. Uh, would W be denoted as a vector? Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. Racing too much here. I, I now have a brand new problem. Let's 
This is gone. This was never there. Now, when I write a vector, and I just write a vector, it's automatically, automatically in terms of the standard basis. So if I write vector 4, negative 6, you don't have to say, well, 4 of what, negative 6 of what? No, it's 4, negative 6. It's automatically relative to the standard basis. That's true for anything you do. I want to write it relative to a non-standard basis. That's what that, that's it. That's why I would need this notation here. It is redundant to write a vector relative to the standard basis using special notation, but I did it to show you that the notation doesn't matter what your basis was. You, you always use the same notation. It's just in, in the case where it's relative to the standard basis, there's just no algebra to perform. I had to do algebra to get those numbers. So if this is not the P inverse I want now. I need a new one. So how do I set up this problem? Get rid of all this. Okay. So now I want to go from you don't need to put the dotted lines, that's just kind of remind us. So what goes first is the basis of B double prime S columns. So 2, negative 1, 1, 2. Then the basis of B prime S columns. Okay. So what should the first step be? I can do a row switch. But then I'm going to have to change signs later. There actually might be a better one. I could take half a row one, or I can add row two to row one. That would put a one in no fractions. By the way, fractions are inevitable, but I don't necessarily have to start with them. So why don't we do row two plus row one? If I do it correctly, you know the final answer is going to be the same no matter the route. Let's just minimize the difficulty of the route. Should that be two and negative one? Did I mess that up? 2, negative 1, 1, 2. Oh, oh, it should be like yeah. By the way, this is absolute. Yeah, this, this is okay. the only area the rest of the semester that will be absolutely unforgiving is if you put things as rows that are supposed to be columns, or you put them as columns when they're supposed to be rows. Yeah, these are columns. These are columns. If I put them as rows, it will completely change every aspect of the answer. Every now and then you can get lucky because maybe you had symmetry, but that's not something you could count on. So we've got to go this route here. So what do we got? Negative 1, 2, 1, negative 1. Then I'd have 1, 3, 2, 0. Now, row 1 plus row 2. Oh, this is nice. So 1, 3, 2, 0. I'd have 0, 5, 3, negative 1. Agree? Now, since I'm only going to have fractions in there for one step, I'm OK putting fractions in right now. So let's do. One fifth row two. So zero one, three fifths negative one fifth. Hopefully we have no errors here. Don't like errors. They make me sad. And I think I, I already see an error. Ah. Or no, no, I don't. Well, hold on. Do I see an error? No, I don't see an error. Sorry. Got something in my eye. Now, what are we doing? Negative 3 row 2 plus row 1. So 1, 0. Negative 3 of these, so negative 9 fifths plus 2 would be 1 fifth. Positive 3 fifths plus 0. So if I didn't mess this one up entirely, I believe my P inverse should be. One fifth, three fifths. Does this look correct, everyone? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's something I haven't done yet. I have not written four negative six as a linear combination of these two guys yet. Aren't I supposed to do that? Yeah, I am. But I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to do it by multiplying the matrix this time. You can do that? Yeah, in fact, in general, it's usually faster if I do it that way, strangely enough. 
I'm going to need to find the transition <laughs> matrix every time you're working with different bases. You've you got to find the transition matrix. There's no way around it. Imagine this was a three by three kind of situation. And maybe these aren't the friendliest set of vectors. You know, you've got some 13s and 7s and 11s. I don't know, you know, maybe that's 17 thrown in there somewhere. You don't have a friendly set of vectors. To do this part here, eh, it can be a little iffy. You, you all know the algebra involved, and you know it's tedious. I warned you about today. That's tedious algebra. But if I have to find this every time anyway, is there an easier way to do this? My question to you is, I would like W relative to B double prime. Well, shouldn't it be this times this? Isn't that what it's supposed to be? So by me working with a non-standard basis, it doesn't change the algebra. I'm still doing the exact same algebra. I'm multiplying the transition matrix by the first vector and changing it to the second vector. So let's do this. If I didn't make any mistakes, negative 1 plus 15, that's 14 over 5. Negative 3, negative 5, that's negative 8 over 5. So it appears that the vector w relative to this new basis b double prime is this, okay, but careful. Is it this? Back hand side. Well, no, 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 careful. This was, I did the transition matrix. So what is this? Is this relative to the standard basis? Uh, no. no. Oh. What are those? Those are multiples, sorry, of these vectors here. Make sure I got that right. If I did that right, those should be multiples of those vectors. Yeah, there we go, okay. So let's go ahead, because I'm gonna leave that up there for a moment. I said the least common problem is non-standard to non-standard. I have an answer. We're not sure what to do with it, so we're gonna actually figure it out. I'm not gonna tell you what to do with it. We're gonna figure out what, where those numbers translate. So what we wanna do, um, I trust this is correct. Let's write the original vector in terms of b double prime. Let's do that off to the side. So I've got, I want to write 4, negative 6 as c1 of 2, negative 1 plus c2 of 1, 2. Did I write that correctly? Yes. So that means we're going to go 2, negative 1, 1, 2, 4, negative 6. So. This is going to feel kind of familiar. So if I add the row 1 plus row 2, so I get 1, 3, negative 2. And now let's do row 1 plus row 2 here. 0, 5, negative 8. So I think C2 is negative 8 fifths. C1 is what would that be? Ah, well, this could be negative 2 plus 24 fifths, so 14 fifths. We'll do a quick check. We'll put it over here. So 4, negative 6, if I did this correctly, is 14 fifths times 2, negative 1, minus 8 fifths times 1, 2. Let's do a quick check. 28 fifths minus 8 fifths is 20 fifths, or 4. Negative 14 fifths, negative 16 fifths, that's negative 30 fifths, or negative 6. Therefore, W, in terms of B prime, double prime, is 14 fifths, negative 8 fifths. Okay, so did we do it right? Yeah. Yeah. Which way was faster? Second way. 
Do you think this way was faster? Or do you think the matrix multiplication was faster? I think the matrix multiplication was probably a little faster. But here's the beauty. What if my matrix is not correct? Then my answer's wrong. But didn't we check our answer just now? Can't we check to see if those are actually the right numbers? And if they are, then everything's flawless. If they're not, then I have to go back and fix it. And, you know, good luck. But we do have a way of knowing for certain. What this means, quite simply, is there's 14 fifths of the one vector plus negative 8 fifths of the other vector to get me back there. If when I physically check this by multiplying it out like we just did, if it checks, it has to be correct. Because there can only be one answer here. So we're seeing two different ways of doing things. So, big picture. The most important part of this process is actually the matrix, not the vectors. I just gave you a random vector, and then we manipulated it. But there's nothing about this vector that's important. It's using the bases to come up with a matrix that will perform the same task. So let's just say hypothetically, here's, here's how I like to think of this from. How many have had physics before? I, I, I remember this from physics, right? You have the little, the little Pinewood Derby and it's going down the track and you're trying to measure the you know, speed every tenth of a second. Remember doing stuff like that? And so you got like a hundred iterations and you know, or maybe you're trying to come up with an equation. Well, if I can come up with, the, with an equation where I only have to insert values of t, it's much faster. If I have to solve something every time I want to do it, it's much slower. In baby algebra, I would teach them how to find areas of things like a trapezoid. Real simple problem. And so th this is actually the same mathematics. I'd show them the area of a trapezoid is the average of the bases times the height. What if I give you two of these three things? Well, if I give you the area and I'm asking you to solve for one of these, well, Let's say I wanted to solve for B1. So I give you the area, I give you B2, B8, you put all the numbers in, you work it out, you manipulate, then you solve. And then I give you like 10 more problems. And you go through the entire process of solving 10 times. Wouldn't it be a heck of a lot easier if you started by solving for B1, then just evaluate, 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 evaluate? You'd be doing about 25% of the work and probably being correct 100% of the time. It's hard to convince a lower level algebra student that this is infinitely faster, easier, and more efficient. No, no, I'll just solve the problem every time. So I've got my Pinewood Derby. I finally figured out an equation. So I'm going to solve the equation 100 times? No, you're going to evaluate the equation 100 times. Way faster. Evaluating is way faster than solving. Evaluating means plug in your numbers, calculate. Solving means you've got to manipulate the variables, move things around, potential for error, and I want to do it every time? Here's my point. I'm going to give you 100 vectors. Do you want to do this process of figuring it out a hundred times? Or would you rather just multiply a hundred times? I think after about the third time you'd realize, oh my gosh, I'm on my tenth problem. My classmates are still on the first one. I can go ten times faster. Yeah. Doing the matrix multiplication means you're doing the evaluation. You're not solving anymore. You've already got the finished form to multiply. That's why the, the using the matrix is actually way more efficient in general. If I was only finding one vector, would it really matter which way I went? No, nah, but if I need to find the transition matrix anyway, you're better off finding that first multiplying and then checking your answer. Yeah. Um, aren't two sets equal if you just switch off the order of elements? I'm sorry? Aren't two sets equal if you just switch off the order of elements? Are two sets equal? Yeah, is that what you're saying? The basis, and it is to each of the elements. Like the yes, basis. but the matrix associated with the, with the basis won't be the same if I switch them up. So the order that they're given will determine the matrix. Think of it if I give you a system of equations. Keep it real simple. I give you a system of equations. If I wrote that as a matrix product, that's, that's easy. Not solving it, just writing as a matrix product. We agree that's easy. I could now solve it using an inverse if I chose of the coefficient matrix. But if I rearrange the original system, it's not going to change my final answer, but it'll change my coefficient matrix and therefore change the inverse of the coefficient matrix. So in other words, all the pieces of the puzzle will look different now. So the rule of thumb is, however a problem is given, leave it in that order because the matrix and the pieces of the matrix that go with it will change otherwise. And does that matter? Yeah, actually it does, because it means that the vector form of your answer will not be the same either. And that, that has a sort of a ripple effect. Once you, once you decide, I'm going to do things in this order, you don't change it. 
Now, before I started the problem, could I have changed the order? Sure. Would it, have, would it have made any difference if I wrote either one of these in reverse order? No, but it would make the process a little, you know, a little more difficult. It, things would have felt backward, would have been correct. But it would have been correct based on whatever order these were expressed in. So if I rearrange the order, your final answer will look different and everything you said was valid. But it won't look like the same thing because your matrices won't be the same. Is it wrong? No, it's the answer to a different question is really what it is. So that's a, that's a good thing that you're bringing up there. You generally want to leave things alone when they're expressed in a certain order. And a lot of times the instructions will be, we're going to do this next week, the instructions will be do all of the stuff using the vectors in the order stated. That way it's just easier for everybody to check themselves too. Because if you're doing a problem and you want to check your answer in the back of the book, rearranging the vectors, all of your, your results will look completely different. You'll say, why are they different? Because it's based on the order they're expressed. That's all. And then later on, there, there's other things that will happen. If you have multiple bases and you want to convert them all into like a unified base, um, is there a way to notate like which? You said, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you're I not going to ever convert your base. Your basis is. No, I mean like if you have vectors that are in relative to like B prime, B double prime, oh, oh, B triple okay. prime, and you want them all relative to B quadruple prime, is there a way to differentiate between what P inverses are? No, that, that is only from one basis to another. Yeah, his, if I have, let's just take this problem here. There's no one P inverse that will work for all three. There's one that will go from here to here, here to here, here to here. Each one will have its own unique one. But you're, ever, you're never going to work with more than two bases at a time. Is that, I think, is that the answer you look for? So you just have to keep them completely separate? Yeah, you, there's no reason to ever work with more than two at a time. What I'm trying to illustrate to you is if the most common problem is standard to non-standard, but I could do non-standard to non-standard. That has less application, but it's still valid. The standard to non-standard is the most common, and it's the most useful, and it's the one we spend most of our time on. But I gotta show you the other one, just in case it comes up so you know what to do. And the algebra we performed for the non-standard to non-standard was exactly the same algebra, wasn't it? In fact, finding the transition, well, this isn't it. I had, Finding this transition matrix was no more work than the first one, because I still had to manipulate the original to make it look like the identity and whatever was on the other side was my answer. Did it matter whether the other side started as the identity or not? No, it doesn't change their steps. Well, that's kind of comforting, so it wouldn't matter how the question was asked. Okay, you guys with me? Now, in the big picture, I want you to be able to do this for problems in R, for vectors in R3. That's gonna be the big picture. That's what we spend most of our time on. But I'm showing you at this level because these problems are not hard, but look at our answers. <laughs> they're all fractions. They're all, they're all things that might slow me down and mess me up. So as long as you're being careful and on top of things, there's no, there's no part of this process that will overwhelm you. It's arithmetic, but it's bookkeeping. Yeah. So if you change the order of, of two vectors in the basis, what do you get the actual vector space? No. No, but it will change a transition matrix and therefore change your results. And that does have a ripple effect later. I'm going to give you a simple example. I'm going to give you a glimpse. This is one of the most important algebraic things we do. I'm going to give you three vectors in R3. I want to create an, what's called an orthonormal basis. Ortho means all mutually orthogonal. The normal means they're all unit vectors. Which vector do you want to start with? Doesn't matter, but your answer will be completely different each time you start with a different vector. So if I start with this one, then my answer will look like, I used to try to do this with my fingers and they'd always cramp up. My answer will look like that. But what if I started with this one? Now my answer's gonna be that. What if I started with this one? Oh, now my answer's gonna be this. Depending on which one I start with, it will be completely different, which would be sort of the equivalent of taking our room and rotating it along an axis to create three mutual starting points. Th does that help a little bit? And, and so the order matters because whatever the first one is establishes everything you do after. The first one could be arbitrary, but once it's selected. And there will be problems that we do where you're gonna answer a question, you're gonna do exactly what I'm describing, but when you answer the question, last day I showed you how to write a vector in the form xh plus xp. What if xh has two parameters? That's actually gonna be really common. Does it matter what order you write them when you're stating your solution? Not at all. 
but they will now form a basis for the null space. And when I start doing manipulation, the order I wrote them will change all answers that come after depending on which one was first because things are going to be rotated and moved. It doesn't make the answer incorrect. It just means that two people in this class can do the exact same problem and have two answers that are completely different because of the order. And you got to choose the order in that case. Ah, that's why it's be mindful that, hey, if I choose a different order, I might get a different answer. Now when I'm checking my answer in the back of the book kind of thing, I did it right, the answer doesn't look anything like mine because the author chose a different order than I did. And understand that you're both right because the order you chose, it was arbitrary. But when the order is selected ahead of time, that's when you don't want to mess with it. Because now everyone should get the same answer. Hopefully that, that helps yeah, a little bit. Okay. Exactly. Now we're going to move on. We're going to look at a very simple application of equation setting. Okay. Now, in a differential equation setting, and I don't, I don't care if you know anything about Dibby cubes, but differential equations means you're solving equations involving derivatives. That's what a differential equation is. The day you learned integration for the very first time in Calc 1, there's always starting integration in Calc 1. What's f of x? You say, well, f of x is obviously x squared. Do we agree? x squared, clearly, it's an answer. What about x squared plus 1? Would that also be an answer? An x squared plus 2? An x squared minus 1? I'm creating what is affectionately known as the Kendall-Abrepa parabola. Try saying that three times fast. I'm, I'm still working on making that the official drunk test for the state of California. But aren't all of these solutions? So what do we do? We say any arbitrary constant would be a solution because its derivative will still be the same thing. So how do I know which one? If I'm given an initial condition, now it's this one, because it's the only one that has 1, 3 on it. An initial condition, therefore, allows you to find the arbitrary constant. Without an initial condition, you always throw in the arbitrary constant. Why am I showing you this? Because this is a differential equation. Any equation involving a derivative that you're solving is a differential equation. That's what the term means. It's just in 255 you solve more complicated ones. In 150, on the first day I introduce integration, I will give you a second derivative and ask you to tell me what the original function is. So I needed to give you initial conditions so you could figure out the constants. You integrated twice. No big deal. But the order of the derivative tells you how many integrations for one thing. But also, it has to do with the numbers of solutions. So I'm going to give you a simple example. You don't need to know anything about Diffie Hughes. But I'm going to give you a really simple example. This has two linearly independent solutions. The first one will be e to the negative 2t. The second one will be e to the 5t. And you'll learn how to do this really, really, really fast. Now, how do I know? I can check it by taking two derivatives of this, running it through there and see if it works. Take two derivatives of this, run it through there. So we would say our solution is c1 of these plus c2 of these because any constant multiple of this will work because of the zero on the right side. So I'm solving the homogeneous equation. How do I know these two solutions are linearly independent? Think I test. They are not multiple of each other. They're not multiples. So they're linearly independent solutions. Okay, that was easy. What if I gave you three or more functions? Particularly, let's say they're polynomial-ish things. Could you automatically determine if they were linearly independent or dependent by just looking at them? Well, we know how to do it. We can set up a linear combination setting it equal to the number zero, which is fine as long as it's really simple. But what if there's e's or sines and cosines? What if I start throwing in other functions? What if there's a lot of them? Doing it the way we're doing it, like we do with vectors, when we do it with vectors, it's easy because I only have scalars. But when I start throwing variables into the linear combinations equaling 
the item of identity? Do you, you all realize how that can get a little bit complicated quickly. So there's, a, there's another way we do it when we're looking at functions that doesn't involve the same form. It involves something called the Ronskian. The Ronskian is a determinant that allows us to determine if a set of functions is linearly independent or not. Okay, And the important thing is, if I have a second order differential equation, this is second order because it's second derivative, the order of the differential equation automatically tells you how many linearly independent solutions you're going to get. So that was easy. But what if I have three or four or five? It may be, and, and, and I'm solving it, and I don't realize that I might have, I might have a few solutions, and one of them is a linear combination of the other ones, and I didn't even see it. There is a way to determine this, and I'm going to walk you through it. The, it's not hard. It's not hard at all. This is really the only time in the course we do any calculus, and our calculus is going to be simple derivatives. No integration. It involves derivatives. So let's remind ourselves. If I said, consider the following. All right, my, my overall answer is C1, Y1, plus C2, Y2, plus, plus C and Y N. I have N functions. And this is my, my final answer is the Y. Okay, great. All right? Um, whether you said dy dx or dy dt, you know, differential equations, your independent variable is usually going to be a t. Don't, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll use x because that makes everyone more comfortable. The derivative of sum is the sum of the derivatives. Sum of the derivatives. That's kind of important. So c1 dy1 dx plus c2 dy2 dx plus cn dyn dx. I can do this all the way down the line, can't I? In other words, what if I did the n minus first derivative of y? Then wouldn't it be the same thing? Be lazy. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a c. And this is d n minus 1. Do you notice I did d n minus 1, not d n? If I have n linearly independent solutions, I want to take n minus 1 derivatives. I'll explain that in a moment. So if I had five linearly independent solutions, I want to take four derivatives. Wow, that's kind of busy. Yes, it is. Okay. I would like to know if these solutions are linearly independent. Well, let's just say hypothetically. Let's say hypothetically that I've given you several functions, and without loss of generality, let's say it's the first function is a combination of the other ones. If it's the third function, then just make that the first function. <laughs> Let's assume for a moment that here's why I want to solve the following. I want to solve this. Now, we know this, right? Because with functions, the additive identity is the number 0. If the only solution to this is that all the coefficients are zeros, that's called the trivial solution. If the only solution to this is all the coefficients are 0, then we know they're linearly independent. But in general, if these are functions, that can be very difficult to actually try to solve. Okay? Is everybody cool with that? I can't use a matrix because I have functions, not scalars. So let's suppose that suppose that y1 equals negative c2 over c1 y2 minus c3 over c1 y3 all the way to negative cn over c1 yn. By the way, if the only solution to this is that all the c's are zeros, then I have a problem, don't I? So suppose this has a solution. Suppose c1 is not zero. Then, uh, First of all, then I know there would be infinitely many, because I have a parameterized in a sense. Okay, let's suppose this is true. Then if I take all the derivatives of y1, won't it look like all the derivatives of these guys for the same reason? Yeah, here's what I want to do. This might seem completely insane. I want to put these guys in a determinant. And we call our determinant, because I'm doing functions of x, we'll call it Ronskian of x. And I'm going to put y1, y2, yn. Then the next row will be dy1 dx, 
dy to dx, dy and dx, all the way down to what? The n minus first derivative. Why the n minus first derivative? This is a determinant. How many columns do you have? N. N. So therefore, how many rows must you have? N. Think of this as the zeroth derivative. That's why we got to stop at n minus 1. Otherwise, it wouldn't be squared. Now, this determinant is either what or what? Zero, zero or not zero. three. No, uh, not zero. Okay. The only way a determinant can be zero is if any row or column is a linear combination. By the way, a direct multiple is still a linear combination. You know, it might be three row ones plus zero of every other row. That's still a linear combination, isn't it? So to be a multiple is a form of linear combination. The only way a determinant can be zero is if one row or column is a linear combination of the others. Now, I said suppose, suppose that y1 is a linear combination of the other functions. You with me? Then that means I'm going to replace that whole first column with what? That. That's the first entry. <laughs> Let me just call that A. <laughs> A and then dA, dx, and then all the way down the line. And mine's first derivative. Okay, I'm going to be really, really lazy. What about all the rest of the columns? They're staying intact. So that's y2 all the way to yn. That's the derivative of y2 all the way to the derivative of yn, and so on. All the way down the line. Isn't my first column, since y1 is a linear combination of all the other columns, isn't the derivative of y1 a linear combination of all the derivatives? Because the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives without the coefficients changing. We know this. You with me? So doesn't that make my entire first column a linear combination of all of the other columns? Which means that the value of this determinant is zero. The only way the determinant can be zero is if one of the functions is a linear combination of the others. Because then all of its derivatives would be linear combinations of the other derivatives, which means that column in the determinant is a combination of all the other columns, thereby giving me zero. The only way I can get not zero is if none of the columns are linear combinations of the other columns. Notice I'm sticking with columns here because the columns are different. So the value of Aronskian is either zero or is not. And here's the rule. If the Aronskian is zero, then we say the functions are linearly dependent. If the Aronskian is non-zero, then they are, in fact, linearly independent. Okay? Turns out this is extremely useful in differential equations. But in differential equations, you're generally not dealing with a lot of things at once. I mean, rarely will you do more than three. You know, sometimes you're only going to do two. It makes it kind of easy. So let's look at an example. Now we have two ways of doing this. I can do c1 of the first plus c2 of the second plus c3 of the third equals the number zero, and I'll treat that as a matrix problem and solve for the c's. That's absolutely correct. That's what you're asked to do on your next quiz. But I'm gonna show you an alternate way of looking at the same problem that will give us the same conclusion using the Ronsky. And that means I have to take a couple of derivatives. Now as long as the functions aren't complicated, this part of the process really isn't going to bother me. Okay, so the Ronskian, which we write W of X, is now 
Now, what's the second row going to be? Now we need to evaluate this. And a lot of you lack a lazy bone. You're actually going to do all this expansion of, really? You want to multiply these out? I don't. Look at your bottom row. <laughs> Aren't 12 and 6 multiples of 2? So why don't we put some zeros in there? But not by row operations, by column operations. You're probably not going to do row operations ever on a RON scheme. You're probably going to do column operations because it's, it's just easier. The, the, rarely will you have rows that will work. So how about if I take negative 3 row 3s plus, excuse me, not for, uh, sorry, column 3s plus column 1. So I'll leave column 1 alone. All right, so negative three of these, that'd be zero. Negative three of these, that'd be negative six x plus nine. Six x minus four, what does that leave me with? That'd be five. So negative three of these would be negative six x plus nine, okay. And how about here? Negative three x squared, positive nine x, so it'd be five x. Positive 21 plus 5. What am I going to do for the second column? Negative 6C3s plus C2. I'm writing it above the column because that's what I'm changing. So negative 6 of these plus this, 0. Negative 6 of these, that's negative 12x, 0. Negative 6, that would be 18 plus 2. And then negative 6 of these plus this, 0. Negative 6 of these plus this, that'd be 20x. Negative 6 of these, 42, minus 1, plus 39. All good? So you maybe expand by the last row. You like that? Did I lose one? 41. Can I not add? 39 should be 41. Negative Second. 6 of these plus that. What did I put? Oh, 41. Thank you. I can't add. Negative 6. Yeah. So, but is this going to be difficult to evaluate? No, because I'm only looking at that part. That should be really simple. Now, no matter how many times I ask this question, I will still have people do this. <laughs> and, and they'll fill up a page, and occasionally they actually get the right answer, occasionally. Usually not very often, just because there's too many steps, too many places to make mistakes. And the problem is, if this answer is supposed to be zero and I make a mistake, I'm not going to get zero. If this answer is not supposed to be zero, I might get zero. <laughs> so you can't make any mistakes. So the answer is two times, because that's in a plus position. I'm going to write it out. 5x plus 26, 5. 20x plus 41, 20. Wow, I like this. So that's going to be 100x plus 520 minus 100x minus, looks like 205, Not zero. which is what? what is it? 305, so that's 610, which is not zero. That's the main thing. And the conclusion is independent, dependent. Independent, independent because, because non skin is not zero. Is not zero. Hmm. This is kind of nice, isn't it? Um, if the way I've asked you to do this particular one on the quiz, I'm asking for linear combinations, you're finding the coefficients and all that, it's it's pretty low level. But what if I had thrown in other things? On the following quiz, I ask you a Ronsky question. I think I throw a log in there and maybe something else. To where 
the doing, trying to do C1, C2, C3 is not going to work very well because I have too much going on. But doing the derivatives actually makes it really, really simple. And as long as this doesn't have too many. See, if I did this with four functions, this is still not complicated, but I would probably have to do more row or column operations because I really would want to whittle it down. <laughs> so your conclusion here is the set is linearly independent because the Ronskin is not identically zero. Now, let me throw a what if at you. Because this is where a lot of the calc folks struggle. I mean, I shouldn't say calc folks, linear folks. What if? Let's just pretend it's that. This is where a lot of people get in trouble. Is 610x equal to zero? But there's a value of x where it is zero. So for the entire number line, that is equal to zero? Or is it only equal to zero for one value? In other words, it's the number zero or it's not. This, let's suppose I have something here just for fun. It's a polynomial that has you know, 37 factors. So there's 37 places where it equals zero. Is it equal to the number zero? No. It doesn't matter if it's equal to zero infinitely many times. If it's not equal to the number zero, then it's not zero. Doesn't matter if there are values of it. By the way, in reality, most problems you'll ever run into there will be a finite number of values that will make it zero. It has nothing to do with independence or not. It only has to do with where the solutions live. So let me, let me give you a hint, because in diff EQ, it becomes less of an issue because you're so used to it. Let's just say this was the right answer. Clearly, zero is a problem, isn't it? That means that these are linearly independent either for all real numbers to the left of zero, or they're linearly independent for all real numbers to the right of zero. But it wouldn't be the whole number line, because I can't have a discontinuity in my domain. Now, how would I know whether they're positive or negative? There would be some initial condition. Or better yet, maybe one of my functions had a log in it. <laughs> now, it's easy. It has to be to the right of zero. So if there were places where this equaled zero, you would deal with that in a Diffie Q class saying, OK, it's not the whole number line. I, I have a finite portion of the, or a smaller portion of the number line. Great. But it's still linearly independent. This is zero or it's not zero. It doesn't matter if there are values of x that make it zero. Do all real numbers make it zero? If the answer is no, then it's not zero. Okay. So no matter how many times I say that, people will read into it something different and come up with an incorrect answer because they say, oh, but, but there was one place where it was zero. Therefore, it's always zero. No. <laughs> no, it's not always zero. OK. Any question on this? Anybody cool? All right, so in general, let's do another one. I don't want it to be too complicated. I'll, I'll give you a really simple one. I have a set of solutions. Sine 2x, cos 2x, e to the 2x. OK, this would be more like a, a differential equations problem. And I'd be really simple. It would be really easy for me to write this, the differential equation to produce this. Okay. So let's find the Ronskian. So the first thing I do is I write all my functions on the top. What's the next row? 2 cosine 2x. And the next row? 4 so good? You can pick any row or column. There is one that is a better choice than the others. The column operation, or row operation to reduce the E? Or Actually, there's multiple ways. So he says, these are all multiples of E. I can put zeros here. I love that idea. If I didn't see that, then which row or column are you best expanding by them? 
probably the last column, so then you're only working with sines and cosines. Does that make sense? Ah. Um, what if I had enough going on in that first column where I couldn't? Then I'd go that way. But I like putting zeros. I'm a big fan of zero. It's my favorite number. You know, if I ever was a professional athlete, that would obviously be my number. Zero. <laughs> That's how many points per game I would have scored, right? <laughs> how many touchdowns I would have caught. All right. So let's do row operations in this case. So how about negative two row ones plus row two and negative four row ones plus row three. Now what this is gonna do is make it a little bit busy. Okay, in fact, I might need more space actually. All right, so I'm doing negative two of these plus this. So I have negative two sine two x plus two cos two x. I'm doing negative two of these plus this. So if you want to keep it as negative sine two x, I'll keep it in the same order, minus two cos two x, and this is zero. Okay, there, there's a reason to put the sines and cosines in the same order. I think it makes it easier later. And then the next one, negative four of these, so I have negative, negative four of these plus this, that's negative eight sine two x, oh I like. Negative four of these plus this, so negative eight cosine two x, and then zero. Looking good. So when I evaluate this, it's going to be e to the 2x times, let's see, negative 2 sine 2x plus 2 cos 2x, negative 2 sine 2x minus 2 cosine of 2x, negative 8 sine 2x, negative 8 cos 2x. Uh, this should be relatively simple as long as I don't make any errors. All right, so when I multiply this out, I'm going to get 16 sine 2x cos 2x minus 16 cos squared 2x minus this product, so it would be minus 16 sine squared 2x and then minus 16 sine 2x cos 2x all times e of the 2x. Well, do I have anything combining or cancel? Those cancel. What's up? If I factor out the negative 16, I'd have a cos squared plus sine squared. So this part's just negative 16. So my final answer is negative 16 e to the 2x, which is, in fact, it's never zero. It's always negative. Now, I think this one, if I'd asked you before I started the problem, sine, sine, cosine, e, I'm pretty sure none of them are combinations of the others, but this is how the process would look. It's far more likely the case that your first solution might have had sine and e in it at the same time. And maybe it was sine times e and cosine times e. That's actually a far more likely scenario. Um, does that represent anything beyond like kind of just this independent? I, I, I'm sorry, say it again. Does the negative 16 e to the 2x represent anything no. besides that? No. Um, are you talking about the sign of it no, or the value? The function, the value? No, no, it's just, it's just, in fact, in this case, because that quantity is never zero, that would mean my three functions are linearly independent over the entire number line. But it's on another domain of that. That's, that's all it would be, yeah. That, there's nothing, nothing more to read into it than that. For our purposes, they're linearly independent because it's not the number zero, and, and we're walking away. But most of you will be in a 255 course next semester, and Ron Skin's often introduced right at the beginning of the, of the course, depending on the textbook, but really early on. And most of you will say, oh yeah, I, I, we did that in linear. 
you're going to have more of a goal. To, we're going to take this and go further next semester. But it's the ability of what it means right now, linear independence. Because when you're solving, when you're solving for a differential equation, if the solution, if you have unique solution, you don't want to accidentally write a solution as a linear combination of something and have less solutions as a result. And this is a simple way of telling. It's really just, it's not very complicated, okay? So we're now done with chapter four, which was the most abstract stuff. Next day, we're going to review and reintroduce dot product. But we're going to be looking at it from a very different point of view. The nice thing is everybody here knows what dot product is. So we're going to start at the very beginning, review the Calc 3 field. You're going to go, great. And then we're going to take dot product to a whole new level, OK? Um, as Emerald would say, we're going to take dot product to notches unknown. In other words, I'm going to show you how to do a dot product between polynomials, a dot product between matrices. In other words, we're going to extend the definition of dot product to apply to all things in vector spaces, which is kind of cool. So dot product will actually be the special case of what we're looking at. We're going to generalize it to be able to apply it to other things. And then when we do that, it opens up a whole bunch of more things that you can eventually do. Okay? Click that. Um, 